up on Dialogue Weekend. The 15th G20 Summit takes place virtually this weekend in Saudi Arabia. What's on the agenda this year? Good news on the COVID-19 vaccine front. More vaccine candidates are proving highly effective at preventing the illness. Is an end finally in sight for the pandemic? And this week's newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Zhong Shi. As more countries get hit by a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic and the world economy continues to suffer, the G20 is holding its 15th Leaders' Summit this weekend. They account for about 90 percent of the global GDP and two-thirds of the world's population. So how will the G20 approach recovering from the pandemic and its ongoing damage to the global economy? To find out more, I'm pleased to be joined by Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, Chu Qian, Assistant Director of the International Monetary Institute at Renmin University of China, and Zhou Rue, Chairman of the Bridge Tank. The Bridge Tank is a member of Task Force on Climate Change and Finance in G20 and T20. Gentlemen, great to have you all on dialogue. Let's kick things off with Mr. Chu Qian. China has been participating in many of those international and multilateral uh, meetings. Uh, each and every one of them faced with a common mission, dual mission, of further containing the pandemic and economic uh, recovery. How do you see the timing of the G20 summit this time, and what do you think are its highlights? Well, I think the timing for the G20 is really correct and it's very important. And also we can say it's very urgent to have the uh, global multilateral meeting like this. As I mentioned, the G20 meeting has been representing like 90 percent of the world GDP, two thirds of the world population, because now it's a time we're facing an unprecedented crisis of the public health care. And more than ever, we need to work together, work closely to win this battle. If separate, we will lose. Only by united together, and we can win this battle. So I think we need a platform, you know, just during this uh, outbreak of the pandemic, just to coordinate with everyone and to coordinate all of our efforts, and uh, to pull out the real strategy, the real leadership, and the real method to conquer this, uh, you know, uh, the common hardship and the common challenge for all the human beings. So I think. Mm. China is a very uh, active participant in this, uh, in this endeavor. So I think China, hand in hand with the other counterparts, will do a lot of commitment and carry out a lot of practice for this task. Mr. Rue, it's a very simple and straightforward principle. Work together, cooperate, and fight this common enemy side by side. But how do you think the G20 mechanism or the framework uh, is in a position to do that, what do G20 member countries need the most at this point? Well, they need cohesion. I want to share the optimism of my fellow panelists, but last year there was no cohesion on, on the side of the U.S., of President Trump, on climate change. Now, this time, of course, is different. It's the COVID, but climate change is a public uh, good. Uh, global public good, uh, which is as severe as urgent as we see uh, as we see it for COVID. So uh, it all will depend on the position of the U.S. Now uh, the European Union uh, seems to be optimistic. Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday, Ursula von der Leyen expressed her confidence in U.S. alignment. Uh, we'll see today, and we'll see within the next 36 hours. But that's only the first point. The second point we need is action after that. Uh, for the last six months of declarations, uh, the G20 hasn't been able to coordinate much of the individual actions of the individual uh, country members. Coordination is key. Uh, Mr. Mock, do you agree with that? Because we're really looking to see whether the G20 can mount a collective response to COVID-19 and its subsequent economic uh, hardships. Um, it's not for a lack of trying because as early as March this year, the G20 held an emergency virtual summit, further committing to work together to battle the pandemic. How would you assess uh, the work, the coordination among G20 members so far? Well, thanks for having me, Zhongshi. 
I think the coordination itself actually has not been bad. Um, but I think the problem here is we can see what the results have been, unfortunately, in that most of the world is immersed in this so-called second wave. Uh, parts of the world, the U.S. in particular, uh, I think it's been one long rolling wave. And I can't help but think of this childhood uh, fable of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf. Here, the big bad wolf being COVID-19. And the story I'm sure all of our listeners, our viewers are familiar with is that one pig built his house out of straw, the other built it out of sticks, and the last pig built it out of brick. So if you have uh, systems that are unable to deal domestically with these challenges, it's going to be hard to have good collective results. And I think mm. China has shown through its government uh, how resilient uh, the government and the will of the people are to fighting public health crises like this. So I hope that it's not just a collective response through the G20, but I think each country or each region of the world also, at least some parts of the world, have some work to do in terms of developing the domestic systems and the political will to mm. contain COVID-19. Uh, let's stay on the pandemic side of the issue of the problem here. On November 12th, the World Health Organization had posted a list of 48 COVID-19 candidate vaccines uh, in clinical evaluation. More than 90% developed by G20 countries. Uh, basically, that says G20 countries have a leg up, have an advantage in access to potential vaccines and some uh, very promising news with a couple of pharmaceutical companies. We'll be talking about that later in the program. But this is not about just one organization. This is not about just one region or one individual country. We don't have an end to the pandemic until everyone has the necessary tools they need to tackle this pandemic. And, and that's therapeutics for now and vaccines in the near future. Mr. Chu Chan, how do you see the prospects for cooperation in this area, in research, production, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines among the G20 countries? Well, I think you have mentioned a very important point in here. Uh, multilateral cooperation is probably the most important thing during this research and distribution of the vaccine of COVID-19. What do you think so? Uh, a lot of people are guessing that, yeah, well, some country or some giant pharmaceutical is probably going to do the research and run first, and probably they're going to make the first dose of the vaccine and make huge profit from it and probably build a war and use this vaccine to blackmail the other country or profit from other countries. Mm. But that is totally a wrong thinking. The true thinking and true thing is that more than ever, we probably need to work with everyone and probably work give out this vaccines to all the other of the co cooperators and all the other nations with a very low price because just think about the current cases china has done a very good protection of the covid 19 during the domestic uh, during the border within the border but uh, with the, our neighbors still have this uh, pandemic going on china cannot fully protect its citizens so right now we're seeing the g20 most of the g20 pharmaceuticals are doing the research on the covid 19 vaccine and we need together to find out how we can develop a more effective doses. We need more samples, not only from China, but also from our neighboring countries, from North America to Af from Africa as well. And also talking about distributions, we need a very, very long cold chain. You know, you have to deliver those vaccines to other countries in a negative 40 degrees Celsius. That is a very diff difficult task and letting alone about funding issues. So the whole human being need to cooperate on this because if one country missed the link and mm. one country still have the outbreak of the pandemic and all the others will soon be affected. So we need to all together to eliminate this uh, disease at once. Mr. Chu, I have another question for you. We know the G20 spearheads efforts in trade promotion and economic development. I want to briefly review with you the recent signing of the RCEP or RCEP the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, and compare and contrast that with the uh, C CPTPP, or the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, analysts say that the RCEP has a focus more in traditional uh, trade in goods, and the uh, CPTPP has a focus on 
for example, trading services, uh, trade in technology, intellectual property. How do you compare these two and what they will do to regional connectivity? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, unite, we will win this battle against the pandemic. And in order to win this pandemic and restore from it, we need uh, economic cooperation. Uh, the RCEP is a trade deal between China and ASEAN countries and Japan and Korea, you know, the regional trading partners. It's been covering more than half of the world GDP and two-thirds of the world population. So it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, this trading partner has been tradition uh, trading partners for quite a long time. And during this trade, uh, within this uh, trading partners, the products and the good trading has become uh, very important. And uh, the CPTPP, well, it's a uh, cross uh, a Pacific Ocean partnership, is also very important. It get involved in, with the service uh, trade and the financial cooperation. So I think uh, eventually this two trading deals or trading arrangement can be uh, comprehensive, can be complementary to each other. So I think China will have no hesitation to be part of both of these trading deals because it does not conflict with each other. So on one hand, China can do the free trade with the goods and products with our trading partners. And also China doesn't mind to have better trading uh, conditions with our service trade partners like in America okay. or in Canada and as well as some other countries. So all in all, I think we need to pass this trading deals and the trading uh, arrangement as soon as possible. Because right now we really need to lower the tariffs. We really need to lower the, the barrier of the trade because we're all more than ever need to trade with each other. Since in some countries they don't have enough uh, supplies of the products like the PPE and some other countries don't have the demand because they're producers, they need a market. So we need to unite to restore our economy and then we can have the resources to restore from the pandemic. Right, and the Chinese president made it clear that China is interested in joining the CPTPP. So I guess we'll keep watching uh, when and if that happens. Mr. Chu, thank you so much for your analysis. And now let's head into another topic under discussion today. This week, we have good news coming from two COVID-19 vaccine candidates. Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna say that their vaccines have been 95% and 94.5% effective, respectively. In late stage trials, the strong results are giving hope to the pandemic afflicted world. But how far do we still need to go for wide distribution of safe and effective vaccines? To understand more about this issue later in our program, we'll talk to Eric Dean, epidemiologist and senior fellow of the Federation of American Scientists. But first, let me go to Mr. Rue. Where is Europe now? in terms of vaccines because we're getting reports that the EU is set to buy vaccines from Pfizer and BioNTech worth about $10 billion. Yeah, thank you for your question. The, the, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, is actually a transatlantic vaccine, if you wish, because it's a cooperation between a, a US-based and a a Germany-based uh, company. Now, I think, well, let's be frank, we've seen no cooperation in this vaccine de development. We've rather seen competition. Surprisingly, the result is not bad because we have good promises. We have several good promises. But the next step is the most important. The real test will be uh, the feedback from clinical trials, from uh, uh, the feedbacks on testing, on, on, sorry, on, on measuring the impact on populations while the different vaccines get disseminated. disseminated. Here this should not be a race uh, because the more information we get from different sets of vaccine, the more we can fine tune each of those vaccines and then converge. And here will be a real test for coordination. And again, I'm not very optimistic if uh, having seen uh, the previous steps of coordination. One of our panelists said, uh, domestic uh, measures have to be put in place. I think let's praise those countries which want to be uh, primo vaccinating. Morocco is one, Bahrain is one, China is one, of course. Uh, and I think we, we, we ought to develop that uh, much, much faster. One quick note, if you allow me, uh, mm. Shui, on the RCEP, uh, just very briefly. Of course, any new uh, mil uh, new regional or multilateral or pre-multilateral uh, trade treaty is good. I would have two points of observation and two points of focus for the members of this treaty. First of all, it is, yes, agreed, it is the largest 
GDP zone which is gathered, but the, the, the openness, you know, the trade openness of this zone is still very low, so the intra-trade is still much below the intra-trade we see in the EU, for instance. So that links me to the next step. One will have to be innovative and to try and look at new uh, uh, complementarities, new mm. uh, comparative advantages within this zone. And I think America could be, uh, you know, the link with the, with the Trans-Pacific Agreement would be important. Don't forget that when the RCEP was initially discussed, uh, President of the U.S. then uh, was President Obama, and Obama was there at the Asian, uh, at the Asian meeting that was in, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia in 2012, I was there, and, and the U.S. might be wanting to be back into the RCEP as well. And yet it was President Trump's, one of President Trump's first actions uh, as president to pull out of uh, TPP. Yes. We'll see if things change Agreed. there now with uh, the, you know, a potential the Democrats new leader in the White House. The Democrats want it. The, 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 the Republicans didn't want But let's see. It will be very important. Mm. The timing will be of essence. Uh, there, there are some you know, commentators or, or, or people who might belong to the next administration uh, in Washington, in Joe Biden's administration, who felt a bit of a hurry from the Asian and from China mm. to kind of push this agreement. I think it would be a good sign to show openness to the U.S., should they be interested, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, Dr. Ding, thanks for joining us today. We were just talking about promising news on the vaccine front uh, uh, from uh, Pfizer and Moderna. 95% and 94.5% efficacy rates are higher than the efficacy of normal flu vaccines. This is a very a technical side, uh, but to our viewers watching, they do sound good enough. Uh, what's happening next? Well, I think um, they are already applying for emergency use authorization mm. from the FDA, so that's a good sign. But we have still have to be a little bit more careful because we need to collect more data. Most of the, these two trials have basically had 150, 200 cases mm. out of 30, 40,000 people actually uh, vaccinated or in the placebo group. So thus, we should wait a little bit longer to actually see the safety results. But the emergency use will allow healthcare workers who urgently need it the most to get it but we still need to see will this 90 percent hold because we know the immunity response at the beginning is always the strongest but sometimes sometimes immunologists and uh, vaccinologists warn they sometimes drop over time doesn't need an extra booster these are the things that we have to find out a little bit more in the coming months dr dean what would you say to people that are maybe a little reluctant to get vaccinated because they worry about the speed of vaccine development, especially considering the political climate, the vaccines were developed. In their, in their mind, um, it, it could have been rushed to meet a certain deadline. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we need a little bit more time, a little bit more patience uh, and, and bigger samples, more people to participate in, mm -hmm. in the trials. But we've also heard from medical experts, Dr. Fauci included, who say we should put to rest those worries, the data, the results are solid, mm -hmm. and people should have confidence uh, in the vaccines. What mm -hmm. would you say? I think uh, the vaccines are very safe. They are almost always very safe. And if they weren't safe, they would not have made it through phase one and phase two. The reason we're able to develop it so fast is, A, obviously the political uh, momentum and the funding is there for rapid development. And the fact that there's a global surge in coronavirus cases, U.S. just passed 11 million, the world has um, passed um, many, many folds more millions. And that actually, in certain ways, allows us to test the vaccine because the vaccine needs natural infection to prove that it works, unless we use challenge trials, which are not. And the fact that we have such a surge allows us to get the answer faster than if we only had very limited infections mm. throughout the world. So in certain ways, this is why it's fast, because the money is there and the worldwide surge of cases is so high that allows us to get answers quicker. But, you know, we, for the most part, we, uh, the Pfizer has said it has passed all safety protocols, but I think, you know, we just want to see 90% is great, but will it drop to 80, 70% over time? But that doesn't mean that it's not safe. 
I think the best precautionary thing is to take it as soon as um, the, it's available to the public in the spring and the mm. summer. Mr. Rue, how is Europe going to address the supply issue? It, it, it's now set to buy uh, vaccines from those uh, big pharmaceuticals that have delivered uh, promising and encouraging news. Um, but is that enough? Well, uh, the exact procedures we are, are still yet to be developed, of course, for very understandable reasons. We're, we're just clearing the last uh, administrative phases, etc. My wish, my wish, as a, uh, as a con, is that European uh, has some good contribution to the world, which is diversity and the sense of valuing diversity. I really hope, and, and the, the, you, actually the policy of the EU allows for that, I really hope that we will not have in Europe a nationalistic view on the vaccines and that on the contrary, we will try and buy and procure and distribute as many different uh, vaccines from different places, different origins. That's good for us, that will allow us to have a feedback on testing different approaches. That's good as a feedback in terms of information for the rest of the world and for different zones and areas. And I really hope that we do that within European countries and through the bilateral aids that we have uh, as different European countries and as the EU in different parts of the world. And I think this mm. is the crucial issue. Uh, it was reminded that we need to be large, uh, have a large spread, large spectrum in spreading the vaccines. I think what's very important is that the different countries uh, collaborate with southern countries and I think here China and the EU have a role to play together. China has joined the COVAX initiative uh, to make the vaccine uh, fully available, politically available uh, and also economically available mm. to many countries in the south and I think it's a very good move. Uh, Dr. Dean, can I get your thoughts on the Chinese vaccine candidates? Uh, five of them are in phase three clinical trials in countries including the UAE, Brazil, Pakistan and Peru and that's according to the Chinese foreign ministry. Uh, what do you see, how do you see the prospects for Chinese developed vaccines? So the Chinese developed vaccines are a different technology than the Moderna and Pfizer. The Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA uh, which is a very new type um, you know, it's never actually been used uh, in a very large scale vaccine before. Well, the Chinese vaccines are the traditional types, the inactivated um, virus. In the inactivated virus, we have much more years of history and experience and, inter and also obviously safety and also precautions. And I think it's also much simpler to transport than the mRNA, which requires freezing temperatures uh, for very, very deep cold temperatures. But uh, at the same time, uh, the inactivator are a little bit slower to manufacture than the mRNA. So they all have advantages and disadvantages. And ultimately, what we want is to stamp this out worldwide. So this is why the COVAX initiative is important. And that's why I'm hopeful the Chinese vaccine could actually have other utilities that they're more stable, they're better for developing countries, and they have better shelf life. So altogether, Having many different approaches for the vaccine design is a good thing. And I think that diversity will ultimately allow us to beat this pandemic together as a world. Absolutely. Dr. Dean, Mr. Rue, thank you so much for your expertise and analysis. We'll leave you there. Thanks so much. And now let's take a look at the newsmaker of the week. person is Emily Murphy. To talk more about her, let me bring back Andy Mock. And Mr. Mock, M Emily Murphy is the administrator of the General Services Administration. This is the lesser known government agency uh, which has so far refused to sign. She has so far refused to sign what's called a letter to ascertainment, acknowledging Joe Biden as the projected U.S. presidential election winner why do you think she's not doing that? Is she being loyal to President Trump because she was 
nominated by Trump back in 2017. Well, certainly, Zhong Shi, I think that is one explanation that is making the rounds in mainstream media. And I don't think we can completely discount that. I think given her background, she's worked at the Republican, Republican National Committee. Uh, so clearly, I think very, uh, someone that is very much in the Republican camp. But that being said, I think she also is not known as uh, someone that is strongly ideological, mm. but really someone that's a professional, a bureaucrat in the positive sense of the word. So it may not be just personal loyalty to Trump, but loyalty to the organization that she works for. And I think in this sense, it is the classic ethical dilemma, meaning that one has uh, conflicting loyalties, and that's very, very difficult uh, to resolve on an ethical plane. But also, I think she's facing, at the very least, uh, professional risk as well, because whatever she decides to do uh, is going to anger uh, either side on this question and may have longer-term professional repercussions for her. Well, she's certainly in her power, in her right, could put things off for now, but there has to come to a point where she signs the letter and lets the pre presidential transition begin. What do you think will uh, compel her to do that? Uh, what are we looking for here? And, if, it, you know, she putting things off has real world issues and consequences, uh, which is now preventing the Biden team from getting the access and funds for that crucial presidential transition. What impact will that bring? Well, I think certainly at the worst, it can hobble and sabotage the incoming Biden administration. Uh, but again, this is at the very worst. And I think that given uh, Biden's deep history, experience, and contacts, as well as those of his, uh, the people he's appointed so far, that they are pursuing other means of getting up to speed as well. And of course, uh, Biden as a career politician, senator, vice president, uh, has, I think, very broad and deep resources. Now, of course, it's much better to have the official support of the government through the GSA uh, to get up to speed. But on the other hand, I don't know that it is as bad as uh, some, especially on the left, are portraying this, but clearly it is a problem. All right, Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Mr. Mock, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for making time for us today. And on behalf of the entire team, we thank you for watching and for the privilege of your time. I'm Dong Shi in Beijing. This is Dialogue Weekend.